Well, hello all. Welcome to the 2021 Virtual Spring Nature Festival sponsored by the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. I am Tom Romito and your host for this program. I'm a board member of the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge and we are the fundraising arm of the refuge. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was established in 1997 to support Ohio's only National Wildlife Refuge complex through youth development, public use projects, and most recently land acquisition and restoration. The refuge is located in the Western Basin of Lake Erie, halfway between Port Clinton and Toledo in some of the most critical wetland habitats in the world. If you're interested in learning more about us and what we do, please use the link that my co-host Julia is placing in the chat box. That link is the Friends of Ottawa's website. And you can navigate to that website and learn how to become a member, how to become a volunteer at the refuge, make a tax deductible donation to support our work or shop at our online nature store. And for your information, the online, the, the nature store is live on the weekends right now. Julia, my, my uh, co-host, is uh, taking it outside. That's where she is at the moment uh, because the visitor's center is not open and won't be until we get authorization from the National, uh, from the uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, Service to open it. So today's program is non-technical photography tricks and tips to get fabulous pictures of birds all year long with Gary Bendig. Gary is the co-owner and operator of Cone, Gary, I sure hope I said that correctly, Camera and the Print Refinery in Perrysburg. It's the only full service camera store and custom photo lab in Northwest Ohio. He's an avid photographer since preteen years, graduated from Bowling Green State University by schooling in visual communications and now focuses on wildlife in his free time with a specialization on birds for 17 years. He can help you with almost anything photographic in one year or another. So we've got these three links in the chat room, the website that I talked to you about, the schedule for the remaining presentations of this festival, and you can sign up for any of them by registering and then there is a survey link I'd ask you to, to click on and take at the end to tell us how you think we did. It, it's helpful to have us, to give us that feedback. And if you do that, take that brief survey, you get a coupon for uh, shopping at our store. So before we begin, I ask that you stay muted to minimize background noise for our presenter. Please type any chat any questions you have in the chat box as we go. And we'll try to make time to address your question when we see it and when Gary is on the appropriate slide. And we'll try to take any at the end that we didn't, weren't able to take during the presentation. So I'm gonna turn off my video and turn the program over to you, Gary, you're on. All right, I'm going to share screen at this point here. There it is. Um, Tom told you everything I was going to tell you about myself. I would just add that uh, Cone Camera and Photo in the print refinery is a place where you have pictures printed. We're a professional grade photo lab. Uh, we make pictures from Locket size to wall hangings. We print our own canvases. We do retouching restorations. And now we do, uh, for the last five years, dye sublimation. That means we print on wood, glass, metal, slate, socks, coffee cups, towels, and dog leashes, anything. We print your pictures on great gift ideas. When I'm not there, I'm out photographing the birds. By the way, thank you for joining us. You should be out photographing birds right now. We're taking the uh, Ottawa uh, Auto Tour, which I will do later today. Um, it's a beautiful day, and I'm glad that you came in to uh, join us for this. I'm going to keep it non-technical. And the idea is, now that migration is over, such that it was, 
Um, it was not a great migration year this year. I think they all flew up uh, along the Mississippi and not as much around here as they normally do. But even though May is over, you're going to want to get out there probably and photograph birds, uh, your resident birds, the ones that are around all year long to keep your chops up. And I'm going to give you some ideas of how you can do that in a non-technical way. So let's get started and see if this thing works. Oh, we teach classes too, photography classes. And every year I do a bird class, two parts, two hours. And then we take a field trip out to uh, McGee. So that'll be next year if you want to join us local people or distant people. What I want to start with is silhouettes because silhouettes are the easiest thing to do. Sometimes they work against you. I know that, but sometimes you can benefit from them. And they happen automatically. This is without any camera knowledge. The camera can be on the green automatic mode, no problem. It doesn't take any post-production knowledge in Photoshop, Lightroom, Pick Monkey, anything, because it happens. When you aim at a subject like this uh, dove here, and you push halfway down on the shutter button, it gets its focus, but it also gets its exposure data. And what it does, the camera, is it exposes for the majority of the picture, all right? So it sees, wow, it's really bright out here for most of the picture. And there's a little bit of the picture that's kind of dark in the shadows, but I, the camera, am going to expose for the majority of it. And that sends the subject into darkness called a silhouette. It happens automatically. And if you just watch for it and you see, oh, all the light is on the far side of the subject, virtually no light is shining on the subject, it's going to go silhouette. Wait until the bird or animal or person for that matter, turns a little bit sideways so they're in profile because that will allow you to identify it. If the bird is aiming, at, aiming its beak at you, it's gonna look like a knob head, right? But as soon as it turns, then you can tell what it is. You can tell at a glance that this is a turkey, I think, without any other information about it. Happens all the time. Anytime all the light is in the background and virtually no light is shining on the subject, you got a silhouette. This cat bird was on the uh, McGee Marsh uh, boardwalk um, a couple of years ago, and I could see because our eyes and brains are more sophisticated than the camera is. I could see it was a catbird. I could see the dark gray feathers, but I knew, hey, it's really bright in the background. There's no light on this bird. It's going to go silhouette. And there it did. It's just a fun thing to do. So watch for it. Next, let's say there's a gull coming your way. and It's high up in the sky. And you want to take a picture of it as it flies by. Your first inclination would be, or used to be, okay, I got to take my lens and zoom it in to super telephoto. So you got a 150 to 600, you zoom it to 600. 75 to 300, you zoom it to 300, and you raise the camera up and you start to look for the bird. It's up there somewhere. Where is it? I can't find it. And the next thing you know, it just flew over your shoulder. So what you do instead to locate the bird in the viewfinder is zoom back. So if it's a 150 to 600 zoom lens, zoom to 150. That'll take in more of the sky instead of just two or three degrees of it. So now that you can see more of the sky, you raise the camera up and put that out of focus spec, which is your bird in the center of the viewfinder and follow it. It's easy to follow if it's in the middle of the viewfinder. Follow it, zoom in while you're following it, push halfway down to focus it, take the picture. Let's make it more interesting. Okay, it's an eagle. You're going to follow it when it's, you can locate it in the viewfinder, zoom in while you're following it, then focus, then shoot, and you got the shot. It's just a matter of locating the bird. Took years to figure that out. I was looking, where, I, it's around here somewhere. All right. One thing that I think we do when we're walking along a trail, for example, is when we see a bird, we go, we stop in our tracks and we say, ooh, cool, a bird. I got to take a picture. You raise the camera, you take the picture. And I encourage you to do that. Get it out of your system. That's fine. But if you have the chance, as I did here, 
decide if you should move, because I want to tell you you're allowed to move. This young worm hawk here, um, Robin, was sitting on a uh, rusty fence post. That was okay, but I'd rather that the civilization of the rusty fence post not be in my wildlife shot. And I found, since she gave me a chance to do this, if I just moved three feet to my right, the leaves that were in on the side of the fence post are now in front of the fence post. And it doesn't give me that civilization in my wildlife shot. You may have to move left or right. For this one, I remember trying crouching down and tiptoes, didn't have much time to do it. And I was able to get an unobstructed bird um, on, a, on a plain background so that the bird pops. You're always watching for the background when you take pictures because the background is going to be there forever. And you don't want to say, man, I got a great picture of a bird. If only I had moved so that stick wasn't in front of its face. Remember that you can move. This grackle, and we don't normally photograph grackles, uh, they're not considered that interesting, but I'll tell you what, that iridescent blue with the yellow eye, they're a really strikingly handsome kind of bird. And this was in the middle of a flowering tree that I happened upon. And I couldn't even tell what kind of bird it was because it's inside of the tree. And it took moving around about a quarter of the way around the tree until I found this tunnel of clarity where there was no obstruction. And that's when I got the picture. I just want you to remember that you can move. A couple of years ago, I was looking uh, at Olander Park for one of the loons that show up every year. And it wasn't there that day. And if I didn't get this picture of a Canada goose, and I don't photograph Canada geese all that much anymore, but if I didn't get this Canada goose shot, I'm gonna come home empty handed. And as I approached from the right, this was a dark goose on dark grass and it's getting dark. There was no picture, but the fact that I moved around in front of it to allow the lights and darks of the shadow and the sun created a better composition. I just want you to remember to move. Same thing here. Mommy Bay uh, Inland Lake. The, uh, I came in from the right. It was dark geese on a dark pond and it's getting dark. Just moving around creates a better composition. This sanderling was at uh, the Maumee Bay Beach. Um, this was last year, last September. And that beach is not a dirty beach, but this is a brown bird and it there were six of them. And they're running around the beach and they're, they're pecking at things and eating things. And it's a brown bird on brown sand with some brown twigs and seashells. And there just wasn't much to the picture, but I figured that maybe one of them would move into these bubbles, this froth that was kind of undulating there. So I positioned myself and just waited, I mean like a minute, not like an hour or a day until it moved into a background that would isolate the bird with no distractions. If you're at a body of water, whatever is on the far side of the water is going to reflect into the water and create part of your background. If it's unlit trees, trees in the shadows, what's gonna reflect is just blackness. That can be striking and good. In this case, late in autumn, thousands of yellow, I don't know if they're oak leaves or maple leaves, but they're on the far side of the water on a peninsula and it all reflects into the water and that creates the background. You're watching for this sort of thing. The background is every bit as important as the subject because the background's going to be there for the life of the picture. So I was at uh, Metzger's uh, driving along the road uh, one March, and I noticed that this mergancer was swimming to the right. And I looked up ahead where I was about to go and saw a big green tarp laying on the rocks. It probably blown off a boat at the boatyard next door. And so I drove up to the tarp knowing it would reflect in the water. So in this case, it's foreground, not background, but same thing. I'm creating the background by being in a place, well, foreground in this case, by being in a place where this color appears and I just waited for the Merc answer to catch up, swim by, got the shot at that point. Okay, one of my favorite action shots 
that's routine, that happens all the time, is the duck flap. I've got two favorite action shots I'm going to tell you about. This is the first one, the duck flap. That's where they rear up and flap their wings and don't go anywhere. Well, if you're standing on a pier or a dock and you're looking out over 50 ducks, you might see, oh, there's a duck flapping. I'm going to, oh, it's done. Oh, there's another one. And you get ready and you focus and it's done. They only do this three or four seconds. If only there was some way that you could know when they're gonna do this. And there is, because they're gonna let you know. This flap thing that they do happens at the end of the preening exercise. They preen to get rid of loose feathers, dead mosquitoes, mites, parasites, um, sand, anything that is on them, they want to get off of them. And so they will preen and they do this at the end of preening, but you can't stand there with your telephoto lens aimed at the duck until they stop preening because they might go on five or 10 more minutes. So you just stand there and you watch them. And eventually what they're gonna do when they're about to be done and they're about to flap is you're gonna watch the duck and the duck is gonna dunk its head just like that, just at that speed. And it's gonna dunk it two times and three times, maybe four, maybe five, and then it's gonna flap. And what they're doing is they're getting water. They're not taking a drink. They're getting water on the back of their head, rolling down the back of their neck, down into their wing pits. And I know that the feathers are waterproof and the water beads up, but just having that water in the crevices of the pits helps when they flap to wash away the stuff. Well, if you know this is going to happen, or now that you know it's going to happen, if you watch a duck, and I hope you get close ducks, not 100 yards out, as soon as it dunks once, that's when you raise up your camera, get the focus because it's going to flap in a few seconds. And once you know that, you can get the duck flap every single time. I'm going to say it's 10 out of 10 times. They're going to dunk two, three, four, five times and they're going to raise up. They're going to flap and then it's back to doing nothing for the rest of the day. You got the shot. I prefer the three quarter facing view. If they're... Um, exactly face on, it's not as flattering. If they're facing away from you, I like that you can get the designs like on a mallard, they'll have these purple uh, epaulets on the side of their uh, wings. And that looks kind of cool, but my favorite is a three quarter view facing you. Sorry, you can't control that, but you can watch for it. You do it all day long, so much fun. And Gary? Here. Would you please identify that uh, that goose that you just had up there? This one? Yep. I think that's not a goose. I think that is called a peeking duck. Oh, okay. Peeking duck is the duck you'll see in your grocer's freezer around, uh, it's a real sad thing, around uh, Thanksgiving time. This was taken at Flower Hospital where there's a great complement of mallards and Canada geese. And what happens is the Peking duck is not a wild duck. It doesn't exist out in nature. They're bred to be frozen and put at your grocers. But what people do, believe it or not, is they'll buy their children or grandchildren a duckling at Easter time, because it's so cute, it's Easter. I'm gonna give the kid a duck or two. And then what happens is the ducks get older and then they relieve themselves around the house. They're too much to take care of. And so they take these ducks and they let them go at the hospital where they can be with other ducks. Trouble is they don't know very good how to fend for themselves because they're not bred to be wild. Um, and, and then people are going out and feeding them Wonder Bread and Doritos and whatnot. It's a horrible thing. If you find ducks, please don't feed them bread and carbohydrates. Feed them uh, peas would be good. Thanks so much, Gary. Peking duck, yeah. Ducks taking off is a fun thing to get with your camera. And it's very difficult until you know how. The thing I like about ducks, one of the many things is you can trust a duck. If a duck is facing to the right and it's going to take off, it's going to take off to the right. With an egret or heron, it's standing there and you think, oh, I think it might take off. It looks nervous. And so you compose the pictures so that there's extra room in front of it 
so that it flies into the frame instead of out of the frame. And you're waiting for it to take off and all of a sudden it wheels around and it goes the other way. But a duck you can count on. If it's facing right, it's gonna take off to the right. So what you would normally do until today is you would focus on the duck, you think it's gonna leave. And when it does, you just got a picture of air because ducks are not like Canada geese. Canada geese taxi along the water or the land and they take off like a 747 real slow, but a duck takes off like a bullet. And if you wait for the thing to fly, it just flew out of the frame and you missed the shot. So here's what you do. You got a duck that you think is gonna leave. And these ducks were easily 100 feet away. This is at Metzger's. I'm in my car on the road and I see a bunch of ducks and they look like they're going to leave. I'll get to that in a minute. If you were to focus on a duck, you're going to miss the shot because it'll fly out of the frame. So here's what you do. You aim at the lead duck or the duck, if there's only one, push halfway down on the shutter button and keep the button halfway depressed. That locks the focus. And then and the ducks are not moving and you are not moving, focus on the duck and lock the focus by keeping the button halfway depressed. And then you swivel the camera to put the duck's head in the lower left-hand corner of the viewfinder, just so you can see the head, so that you can keep an eye on it, so to speak. And when it leaves and it starts to fly, and if it's facing right, it'll fly right. When it leaves, it takes off like a bullet, but your reflexes are fast enough to start click, 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 and try to follow it, it's flying into the frame instead of out of the frame. So you say, well, I don't know when a duck is gonna leave. You can't tell. Well, you can. This is not as reliable as a head dunk I'm gonna flap, but this is fairly reliable. If a duck or ducks, if a duck is about to leave, first thing it does is it talks quietly to itself. It starts to quack rapidly and quietly. Quack, 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 quack. As though it's talking to itself and saying, I don't know if I should leave or if I should go. This guy's looking at me with a camera and he doesn't seem to be threatening, but maybe I want to go over there. I can't decide. I was over there this morning. It was kind of just quack, 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 quack. That's a signal they're probably going to leave. And then there's the dead giveaway. And this is just a theory, but it makes so much sense to me. I think it's true. If you're watching a duck, and that duck turns its head and puts one eye towards the sky and then puts its head back like this, boom, it's going to be gone in a heartbeat. Here's what I think they're doing. A duck doesn't know if it waddled or drifted under a footbridge and it knows that it takes off really quickly. They don't want to break their neck on the bottom of the footbridge. They don't want eight Canada geese to be flying in, landing gear down, going to go over the duck and land in the water ahead of it. They don't want to fly up into the belly of a goose. So they just look and check their airspace. All's clear. Boom, and they're gone. And so when you recognize that that's what they're going to do, you can get the ducks leaving all the time because you have that second or two to get ready, focus on them, and then get the shot. You can do it all the time, near or far. Oh, if they're in the water, by the way, like this. This is non-technical, but I'll just give you a hint in parentheses. You got to be at a thousandth of a second or faster. And the reason is those water drops, you want them to be water drops and not water lines. At a slower shutter speed, the drops are going to move through time and space like fireworks. And they're water lines. Water drops are cooler than water lines. And you get them by being at a thousandth of a second. That's whether you're plinking a pebble in a pond or whether it's waves crashing on the breakwaters in McGee or whether it's ducks kicking up water drops like this, thousandth of a second. Oh, we have classes at Cones also, if you wanna learn how to do this. Those do get a little bit technical, but it's not bad. So yeah, you can get ducks taken off all the time because you recognize when they're gonna do it. They talk to themselves, they check their airspace. Now, still on ducks. I'm gonna submit, I'm gonna submit to you that the most intimate portrait that you can get of a bird whenever possible, an animal, wild or domestic, and people, young or old, 
I'm going to suggest that the most intimate portrait you can get of them is the eye level portrait. You're not looking down at them. You're not looking up to them. You are even Stephen on par with them in terms of importance. And you or the camera is looking at them from the viewpoint of what another of their kind would see if they were looking at that animal or bird or person. I know you can't do this with birds all the time because they perch high up in the trees and it's impossible. But if you have a choice, and this was at Sheldon Marsh where they come out to the front row looking for handouts, I had to get down on one knee so I wasn't looking down at this bird. I want to look straight at the bird. I want to be on level, on par with it. The other thing that the eye level portrait does, and sometimes it means getting down on the ground, and I'll tell you, as the years go on, getting down there is getting more and more difficult. Getting up is getting almost impossible, but there's no deadline, so it takes a minute or two to get up off the ground. To get down and get the eye level portrait of the animal does this other thing. It provides depth. In all of photography, and this is whether it's a post on Facebook, uh, four by six on the refrigerator stuck with a magnet, or a canvas gallery wrap above the couch that you had printed at Cones, all we have is width and height. That's it, just width and height, two dimensions. But in reality, we're used to having depth, an indication, this third dimension that there is near, there is middle, and there is far. And when you get down at the eye level of the animals, such as these that are on the ground, you can see that a hundred yards away in the background is some earth, some land. There is near stuff, out of focus gravel, then the subject and those yellow flowers, those are in focus, and then in the background is background. And you can figure, you can imagine that if I walked up to these geese, hey, look, there's a couple of geese there. And I lifted up my camera and photographed them, I'd have like two feet in front of them and two feet behind them, not much depth. Getting at eye level gets a lot of depth. Hey, Gary. Here. Greater white fronted goose? Well, sure. No, I don't actually know. I think it is. I think it is. That's, that's a rare sighting. Look at that bill. Okay, so this, from what I understand, is a rare sighting. And I had to hike miles to get this. No, I'm just walking along at, uh, this was at uh, Ottawa, actually. And uh, yeah, this is at, uh, this is at uh, Ottawa. Yeah, I, I asked the, anybody in the audience who can put a positive ID on that to, to put it in the chat room. Thanks, Gary. That's interesting, sure. This was shot from a vehicle. There's this place, by the way, at Maui Bay State Park. It's in the last parking lot. It is um, the big parking lot. And, and you, you, you go to that last parking lot and you go all the way to the right and there's this loop. And on this loop, I always go counterclockwise. So you can look out the right to the inland lake. I always check for avocets and there never are any, but I always check well, certain times of the year. And then you come around the loop and now you are, if you look to the right of the passenger window, you're looking at Lake Erie. So Lake Erie is in the background of this. Well, here's the cool thing about this place. If you're in your vehicle, a standard car, pickup truck is a little bit higher, but in a car, when you're looking out the window at this place and all the parking spaces are like this. I'm saying you come in and you go sideways to the parking spaces. Make sure there are no cars there. You'll crash into them. Anyway, when you look out towards Lake Erie, there is a slope up and then a sidewalk where all the uh, bicyclists, strollers, joggers, walkers, all of these people are on this sidewalk. And then it slopes down to the beach and then it slopes down to the water. When you're in your car at this place, you're at eye level with the sidewalk. So if there's anything on the sidewalk, such as gulls or this kill deer, you'll be at eye level. But shooting from the comfort or, or from the relative uh, obscurity of being in your car, which will act as a blind a lot of the time, these birds, they mind you. They don't mind your car. So eye level shot. No messy getting down on the ground, shot right from the car. Eye level, plain background as always. Uh, Gary? Here. Uh, Ewa, one of our 
attendees says that that bird I talked about was a juvenile trumpeter swans. And I defer to her on that. So, uh, okay, so not so rare. Yeah, that's right. Not so we, rare. We still like them. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Okay, thanks for the update. The other side of the river has got to be 150 yards away. And uh, uh, getting the camera down to eye level prevents there from being just water, bird, water. No, it shows as a background and it introduces some color to the picture, which there otherwise would not have been. This dove, you can, I'm on my belly for this. And you can, um, you can imagine if I had been walking along, this is at Toledo Botanical Gardens outside the cabin. If I had been walking along, oh look, a dove that's not flying away. Lift the camera, take the picture, I'd have three inches of ground, the dove three inches of ground. But to get down and get eye level shows that there's an environment that this bird is in. And I get the viewpoint of what another dove would see if they're looking at this dove. I should probably say that there's one time and place when you do not want to get on your belly. And I don't mean on a road. You got to watch for traffic if you do this on a road. But that's not what I mean. The place that you do not get on your belly is summertime, June, July, August, September, at Maumee Bay, or I would say anywhere else on the beach. Learn this the hard way. On the beach, and I was uh, photographing eye level seagulls, probably the one that was the title slide of this. The trouble is in the summer, hot summer, the beach has chiggers in it. Chiggers do not burrow under the skin and lay their eggs. I, that's folklore. I think it's scabies that, that do that. But chiggers are this biting bug that are a hundredth of an inch big. You're not going to see them with their, your naked eye. You're not going to feel them. You're not going to notice them when you get home. You don't notice them until about 2.30 in the morning when that poison enzyme that they put all over your legs and torso starts to itch. Don't get on your belly on the beach without a towel. But other places, gravel, grass, watch for ticks. I know you got to be careful. Um, at the very least, you could, I know my camera here with me, but some of you have a flip out screen. Right, so you have the camera and the screens on the back and you can, uh, with some cameras, you can pull the screen out and turn it and use it as your viewfinder. And you can be just on your knees, relatively safe from bugs and, um, and use the screen as a viewfinder, looking down into it while you only have contact with the ground with your feet and your, and your knees. That's another way to do it. Getting down at eye level also helps give uh, an idea of scale because you know um, how big a blade of grass is, for example, or some of these little bits of leaves. This bird is now probably four feet tall with a seven foot wingspan. But back then it was about, what do you figure, uh, about a foot tall. This is a sandhill crane. And if nobody's been there, or even if you have, I wanna remind you, that right about now would be a good time to go to Kensington Metro Park. That's northeast of Ann Arbor. And uh, shoot, they have sandhill cranes like Sidecut has squirrels. I mean, they're everywhere and they're on the trails like this one. Well, uh, third week of May, fourth week of May, even now you got the young ones walking around. You do not want to go to Kensington looking for sandhills on the first or second week of May because they're all way off the trail sitting on eggs waiting for them to hatch. You won't see a sandhill crane. The rest of the year you will. Beginning of June, you're gonna see these little ones and boy, are they funny looking. All right, um, this is my second favorite or my, another of my favorites, action shots that happens all the time that you can get. It's the fish flip, any heron or any egret when it darts into the water and brings up a fish, it's going to flip it around and swallow it head first without fail. And this is for a couple of reasons. I think this is great because they just, they just know this. The fish will not go down sideways, so they don't even try, depending on the size of it. They don't try. But they also don't put it down tail first for two reasons. Number one, 
if the bird tries to make the, the fish go down tail first, the fish is just going to wiggle, dive out of the mouth, and escape to the safety of the water. But the more important reason is, if the fish did go down the throat tail first, those gills are going to open and those are razor sharp and they're going to lodge in the throat of the bird and choke it to death. And the bird just knows this. So always, without fail, they're going to grab the fish, they're going to flip it around, and it's going to go down the gullet head first. Now, you can't wait for this shot. You can't decide, ooh, he got a fish. I'm going to wait until it flips it and I'll get it because your reflexes aren't fast enough. But if you know it's going to happen, you can shoot through the action. When a heron or egret grabs a fish and brings its head back up, wait one second just one second, then start shooting in what's called burst mode or continuous shooting. That means that when you lean on the shutter button, it's gonna go click, 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 click until you let up on the button. So when the bird grabs the fish and brings its head up, wait one second, then go click, 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 click as the thing flips the fish and you get it in midair. And you can do this all day long because there is not going to be any exception. They never seem to grab them by the head. They grab them broadside. And that means that they have to flip them so that the head is gonna go down the throat um, head first. Always, always, always. It's just so fun to get that. It's gonna happen. All you gotta do is expect it. Now, this burst mode or continuous shooting, not continuous focus, that's something different. Continuous shooting, lean on the button, click, 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 click until you let up. That um, has given rise to a, a saying, which is maybe you've heard of this. The saying is spray and pray. And the idea is that when you're just starting out with this, you're spraying the subject with shutter clicks and praying that you get a shot out of it. When you do this, click, 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 the viewfinder goes black for every picture. That's whether it's a mirrorless camera or whether it's a standard SLR. You can't see the pictures that you take until after you take them because the viewfinder is going to go black. So you're just praying that you get a shot and look at them later. Well, after you use this method more often, it's not spray and pray anymore. You're using it as a tool. You're using continuous shooting not to pray that you get a shot, but to ensure that you get a shot. Sometimes you're gonna have dumb luck. I happen to be photographing this tree swallow. And if I specialized in this kind of shot, I'd never get this shot again. I wouldn't, they're too quick. You cannot wait for the tree swallow to take off. Oh, I think I'll take a picture of it taking off. I bet it's gonna go soon. You can't tell when it's gonna happen. You can't react quick enough to get it. But I happen to be photographing this thing all along. Click, 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 click. It was being dive bombed by its peers. It was plucking and preening, raising its wings, it was being very active. You wouldn't do this with a perch bird, a yellow warbler just sitting there sit, singing. You wouldn't do this. But if there is motion or you anticipate motion, like in the fish flip, you shoot through the action before, during, and after, and then pick the best one like this. About this time, uh, June and July, Howard Marsh, or anywhere, I suppose, the barn swallows are out and the young ones are waiting to be fed. Um, and so I will put the camera down on the railing and I'm left eyed. So I'm going to look through the viewfinder to compose it so that the little bird that's waiting to be fed is in the viewfinder. But I'm going to turn my head and keep this eye open as well and just kind of watch the periphery. If there's a barn swallow way up there, it's not gonna deliver food. But I could tell that there's one coming in level with this bird, and that means it's going to make a deposit. And when it gets close enough, click, 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 pick the best one. A lot of times you know where the action is gonna be, but you don't know when it's going to be. But if you can start clicking a second or two before, that action, which is only momentary. I mean, this scene happened or it lasted for nothing. Well, you have to be clicking in order to get that sort of thing. Um, 
this is back at that sidewalk. I'm aiming out, in this case, it was my driver's side window, but I'm at that sidewalk at Maumee Bay where this, uh, the grass slopes up, sidewalk, there was a gull there, and then it slopes back down to the beach. If you're at eye level with a gull in this case, and it takes off, and you, you focus on the goal as it's standing there, when it takes off, it'll still be in focus for, I don't know, a half a second or a second before it flies out of focus or out of the frame. And it's just a matter of, again, shooting through the action. I saw that it was taking off, click, 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 choose the best one. You cannot wait and say, I want to get an eye visible through parted feathers. No, we just have to shoot a lot. Um, Pick the best one. Don't tell people that you shot a lot. Excuse me, Gary. Yes. We have a question from Marie. Uh, what shutter speed for heron flipping the fish? Wow, cool question. Um, it's got to be fast, but ungodly fast. I'm going to say a 500th would do it. I don't think a 125th, certainly not a 60th, if you want to have a lot of light or crank up the ISO to allow or force the camera to use a faster shutter speed. But a 500th or a thousandth absolutely for sure is gonna nail it. I think a 500th will do it. Or if you have the middle ones, um, a 640th or an 800th. Yeah, you don't, want a, you don't want the fish to be blurred in its motion. It's gotta be, and it, it really happens quick. It's the head that's moving faster than the fish when it flips it. 640th, 800th, 1000s, guaranteed, no problem. Thanks, Gary. Sure. And that, wrapping up just a little early, I'd rather go early than to go long because you probably have other things to do and should be out shooting birds anyway. That is my presentation of tips and tricks throughout the rest of the year. Whoa, well, thanks so much, Gary. We are, we are done a little earlier than I, than I thought. Um, so we're, we're now in a mode of being able to have a conversation with our audience. So listening audience, I encourage you, if you have a question for Gary, you can ask him directly uh, without me in the middle. Just unmute again by clicking on, uh, you know, the microphone in the lower left of your screen or press the space bar. Say hi to Gary and, and ask your question. So audience, um, ask on. Uh, hello, Gary. Thank you very much. Amazing tips. I'm just curious, which kind of material do you have? Which body and lens do you use? I have currently the Canon 90D. I had the 10D, 20D, 40D, 60D, 70D, 80D, and now 90D. This is since 2003. I think I counted seven cameras. I had my film camera for 27 years, but now that we're into digital, the stuff changes like cell phones, you know, and they come out with more megapixels and faster autofocus and more frames per second. Oh my God, now I'm up at 11 frames per second. This is fabulous to get those in between, you know, flight shots. We got the 90D and I'm using the Tamron 150 to 600 and it took a year to get used to that four pound weight of that sucker. It's heavy, but man, it's got to reach. Um, Gary, you go ahead. Um, uh, go ahead and complete that question now. I think it was. Okay, real fine, Gary. Uh, a question here from Susan. Where was that location at Mommy Bay again? Um, all right, so you go to the main parking lot, the one that holds 400 cars, right at, uh, right at Lake Erie. All right, that's where, if you pull into a parking space at the very end of the parking lot, you pull into the parking space, you're going to be looking at Lake Erie. If you could only see above that slope, you're facing Lake Erie. And there's this turnaround so you can see the inland lake. And as you come around, then you can see the beach and see if there's any eagles there or the odd heron or whatever. But I do want to mention this. <laughs> I didn't learn this until last year. This is incredibly stupid. So I, I do this, this turnaround at the very end 
of the last parking lot in Maumee Bay that's right on the lake. And you do this turnaround, and now I can look out my passenger window and see a lot of the beach, and there's nothing here, and you leave. I leave. Trouble is, you can't see from your vehicle, not even if it's a pickup truck, not even if it's a semi tractor and trailer, which wouldn't make the turnaround anyway, you cannot see the water's edge because although the grass slopes up, sidewalk slopes down, beach, those sanderlings, for example, are out of sight from the vehicle. You have to get out of the car and walk to the beach to find if there's going to be any shorebirds because the shore is not visible from the parking lot. Even if you get out of your car and you stand up and you stand on tiptoes, you still won't see the water's edge. You gotta go there to find these little things that are scampering around the beach. Okay, Gary, um, Kevin has asked, I'm, I'm sorry, Margaret has asked, does your camera autofocus on the eyes automatically? On the eyes, no. Uh, well. Uh, indirectly, your cameras will allow you to choose what focus point. And the focus point points are those squares or rectangles that you see in the viewfinder. Traditionally, you got a diamond-shaped bunch of, what, maybe eight of them and a ninth one directly in the center. And what the camera will focus on right from the factory, right out of the box, unless you change it, the camera is going to be set from the factory so that all of those focus points are active. They're all reporting for duty when you push halfway down on the shutter button. The problem with using it that way is that whatever one of those focus points notices as an object that's the closest object to the camera, that's what it focuses on. So let's say I'm photographing a heron and there's two gladiolas between me and the heron it's going to focus on one of the gladiolas because they're closer to me than is the heron. So what I do is, and what I suggest to anybody, if you can get used to it, is set it, the camera, so that only the center focus point is the one that's active. Only the center focus point. It is the fastest to focus and the most accurate to focus. So to answer your question, well, indirectly, it's going to focus on the eye because I'm going to put the eyeball dead center, press halfway down on the shutter button, thereby focusing on the eye. This locks the focus. I have pushed halfway down on the shutter button and it's locked at whatever that eye distance is. And then I just swivel the camera to compose the picture to put the rest of the bird where I want it in the frame. Then when I push the rest of the way down, the eye is still in focus because it's been in focus because I locked focus and I didn't move and the bird didn't move. So it doesn't focus automatically on the eye, but I make it be so myself with a little bit of intervention. If that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Um, I don't see any further questions on the chat room. I see a number of... Uh, of um, accolades for you, Gary. Um, you. Kevin, it says, excellent presentation. Observing animal behavior is an important factor in capturing good bird images. Yeah, and I didn't know that when starting out so many years ago. The behavior really helps you in the photography because the behavior leads to the shots if you know what the behavior is. And M Maria said earlier that you isolate the head in free space instead of crowded background. I, I guess that's a, uh, a technique that you probably employ, Gary. I'm looking for always um, simplicity. Um, no distractions, no, nothing to obscure the bird. It means I have to move a lot. It means I fail a lot because the stick is in front of its face. It doesn't matter where I move, the stick's in front of its face. I forsake that shot instead of typing and posting it. Uh, please forgive the poor quality, but I couldn't move because the stick was in the way. No, I just didn't get the shot. <laughs> I would like to mention one thing about this picture that's up there now. It's, I promised that I would be non-technical. 
but I got to tell you that this shot, this is how it looked out of the camera because it's been underexposed. A white thing in the sun, so for me that means swan, gull, egret. For some of you, it might mean white wedding dress outside. Anything that is white and in the sun, you have to underexpose or there won't be any detail. When you underexpose, that means it makes the picture darker. Well, look what happened to the background, which was muddy water. But this is so underexposed for the sake of the white feathers in the sun that the background just went to black. This is not, oh, he did Photoshop and painted the background black. No, this is how you capture a white thing in the sun is to underexpose. You look it up in your manual. Underexpose for the sake of the white feather details. All right, that's as technical as I'm getting. I, I made a, <clears throat> the comment about isolating the, the head in the free space when you were showing the, I, I guess it was goose, and you were talking about uh, being at eye level and you were on the ground. Yes. So the, the head of those goose were in the sky instead of being on the grass, so you isolated the heads because the background was the sky, so... It was plain, very plain. Yeah. Yeah. Always trying for that. A plain background. My pictures are of these animals or birds or rarely people. And if there's clutter or distractions, I think that takes away from the animal or bird or people. So a lot of times it just means moving. You just move. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, in fact, maybe more than once in this presentation, to get down to eye level, yes, you can see sky back there because the camera is low enough to get it. Hmm. And Gary, um, Becky has asked, what do you think about back button focusing? Does it help you focus faster on things like birds? Um, back button focusing is is a must. I have a heck of a time explaining why, and I'm not even going to try it. But I am, it has to do with, um, what she's asking is, hey, most people are focusing by pushing halfway down on the shutter button. But there is this thing called back button focus. You program one of these thumb buttons that are on the back. You program it on the camera, it has custom functions that you can decide how your camera is going to behave. So you program one of those buttons to be the focus button and not this one any longer. This one is now just for taking the picture. This one is for focusing. And what it means is, in brief, that let's say you focus on the subject and then you recompose to put the bird somewhere else in the frame. If you let up on the button and push halfway down again in order to push all the way down to take the picture, it's going to refocus on something in the background and you don't want that. So you isolate these two buttons. One is for focus, one is for shooting. And boy, I tried it about 10 years ago and I, I couldn't warm up to it. And, and I, I was told by a Canon professional, no, if you're shooting birds, you want back button focus. All right, I tried it for about an hour. Forget it. I can't get it. It's, it's too weird. I can't cope with this. So I let it go for about a year and I tried again. And now I would never, ever go back. Absolutely. I mean, it'd be like playing a piano one handed. No, you use two hands. In this case, you're using two fingers. This is for focus. This is for shooting. Wow. Yes, I find it helpful. Okay, Gary. Well, thank you very much. That's about seven of the hour. It sounds like uh, the audience is happy. There's no more questions. So uh, I do have a quick question. Oh, let's go right ahead, please. Um, my name is Laura and I'm fairly new to wildlife photography, but it has quickly become a passion. I am shooting with a Canon um, 90D that's brand new to me. And then I also am using the Tamron 150 600 zoom lens as well. And so I'm trying to, to find the perfect marriage between uh, these um, items. And one thing that I'm struggling with right now is 
when I'm trying to capture a bird in flight and there's motion, maybe it's just been fishing, maybe it's coming into the water or for a landing, where is the best place in my screen to focus to not cut off the head, the wings, um, and, and still be able to, to capture a perfect shot and stay in focus? You're going to be struggling with that forever. And the reason <laughs> is you just, you just are. It's really aggravating. I feel for you. Um, you're compelled to zoom in to 600 millimeter. You want to fill the frame with that bird. You don't want it to be an environmental shot featuring a bird. No, you want the bird to fill up the shot. Well, if it's standing and it goes to take off, it's going to lift its wings. Now its wings, like my arms, have just cut off. It, when, it's, when it's standing there, it's fine. And then it goes to fly and, oh, you're too close to it. <laughs> yes. So there is nothing you can do unless you try purposely to shoot loose and resist that temptation to zoom in all the way. Zoom in maybe to 400 millimeter and then crop it later now that you didn't cut off the wings or the head. Boy, tough choice. No, you, you never, especially these big things like egrets or herons with a seven foot wingspan, they open up and you had no idea they were that big, even though you've seen them a hundred times before. <laughs> you wind up cutting something off and then yes. the picture just isn't as good. Thank but you. But you're not, you're not going to take up crossword puzzles instead. You're going to keep on trying, darn it, right? That's right. Okay. Okay, Thank Garrett. You. Looks like one of our attendees is going to check out your class schedule. You might have a new customer. Oh, cool. Great. Thanks. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's five of the hour, and it's a, it's a comfortable time to wrap it up.